Okay, our um, final speaker this morning is um, Diana Wright. Um, her graduate work concentrated on the comparison of neutron activation analysis and inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Um, these techniques were used to elementally profile ceramic architectural artifacts. Um, she earned her PhD degree from the University of Maryland and where she joined the FBI laboratory. In 2001, she joined the chemistry unit in the paints and polymer subunit where she currently does casework and is a forensic examiner in specialties of tapes, paint, and polymeric analysis. Dr. Wright is also a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, as well as a member of the E30 committee of the forensic science section of ASTM. Her presentation today is, is entitled Discrimination of Architectural Paints via Physical and Chemical Methods of Analysis. Good morning. Well, there'll be no Raman in this talk today fortunately or unfortunately, and depending upon how you feel about that, my husband's Australian, so I may be um, applying for a job in New South Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> we embarked on this work because we find so often in the literature uh, a lot to, to um, use as a reference for drawing conclusions on our automotive paints, but we haven't found so much in recent years on architectural paints, and <clears throat> we don't see as many architectural paints in our laboratory in casework, but when it does come up and you have a single layer white paint transfer, what can you say about it? What's the significance of that? <clears throat> so we embarked on this project to see how well our SOP is working for discrimination of paints and what sort of conclusions we can draw from the analyses that we're performing. Previous work was done uh, 40 years ago now by Tippett. Now in human years, we all know 40 is not old, not old at all. But in terms of work you want to bring into court to justify the basis of what you're doing, <clears throat> we thought that we could probably update that a bit. Tippett's work, however, did study 2,000 architectural paint samples, so it was quite a comprehensive study. Using microscopic and microchemical techniques, Tippett found that in these 2,000 samples, he could provide a discrimination or chance of a random association of one and a quarter million, so quite good discrimination. And then when he combined instrumental techniques, in his case emission spectrography and PIGC, that chance of random association jumped to one in a million. <clears throat> so the purpose of this study then was to update Tippett's research to assess more current paint formulations. Surely the paint industry has updated itself in 40 years. To determine if the discriminating power could be improved with advanced analytical capabilities to attempt to address the significance of associations, and also to translate those significant assessments into language that might provide clearer, more standalone reports, as was recommended in the recent NAS study. <clears throat> Samples were collected by FBI field and lab personnel, as well as colleagues at other forensic laboratories in North America. Over 950 samples were submitted. <clears throat> they were collected from a range of structures, interior and exteriors of residences, businesses, parks, restaurants. And this was our sample collection form that we sent out requesting samples. The information we asked for was also quite similar to what Tippett had looked for 40 years ago. We wanted to know the sample color, the geographic location of the sample, what type of building it was on, whether it was a house or a business, <clears throat> whether it was on a windowsill or a wall as its substrate, any kind of environmental conditions that we would want to know about, whether it was an interior or an exterior finish, whether it was indirect sunlight, what have you. <clears throat> the manufacturer, if that was known, the approximate age of the structure, the date of its most recent paint application, and the number of coats that were applied. We used our current analytical scheme for comparative paint samples, where, of course, you start with macroscopic and microscopic examinations. We recorded the top coat color, the number of layers, the sequence of the layers. We did record what the substrate was on the samples. We then went on to FTIR, where, again, for paint examiners, this is going to be quite familiar. We analyzed uh, looking for the organic binder and also any inorganic pigments and fillers in the sample. We used a microscope accessory on the FTIR. We used a uh, diamond cell 
diamond compression cell for our analysis, and our detector cuts off at 650. <clears throat> we then went on SEM EDS, both backscatter and EDS analysis, again, to image the samples, which proved to be quite helpful with some of the trickier layer structures, and also to assess inorganic pigments and fillers, and then finally on to PIG CMS, where again we were confirming and in some cases differentiating the organic binders. The samples were initially divided into groups by their top coat color. We had a blue group, a green group, a red group, et cetera. Doing this, we had about 200 samples that were classified as white. The rest of the samples had some sort of a hue to them. And the largest group of hued samples was off-white, of course, and there are about 300 samples in that category. So this is a pie chart breakdown of the samples we received. As you can see, uh, most 80% were hued, about 20% were white. And within those hued categories, it was off-white, black and gray were combined, yellow and peach were combined, brown and tan were combined, et cetera. And here's a depiction of some of the larger samples we received. We did also receive casework size samples, but this is just to kind of give you an idea of how the categories were breaking out. The first step in the examination process of each individual sample was, of course, to determine was it even paint. And 15 samples turned out to not even be paint. So they were just eliminated from the study. That left 960 samples to be intercompared. That was over 460,000 pairwise comparisons that needed to be performed. Is this a good time to say there were three of us working on this study? <clears throat> if the sample was paint, we then assessed the layer structure. What was the sequence of the layers, the color and relative thicknesses of the layers, features of the layers, such as were there air voids, were the paints delaminating at certain interfaces, et cetera. <clears throat> we did record what the substrate was, but we didn't factor it into comparative assessments. So in other words, if there was a paint that was on wood and a paint that was on drywall, the purpose of the study was could we discriminate between the paints, not could we discriminate between the entire system to include the substrate. So for example, if this is one of the samples we received, you might call it red, you might call it red-brown, you might call it brick, you might call it something else depending upon how good my monitor is here today. <clears throat> but because we didn't want to miss any intercomparisons, this sample would be compared both to the red group and the brown group. So where I said there were 460 plus pairwise, 460,000 plus pairwise comparisons, this sample here in the middle was compared to two different groups. So that number was artificially low in some sense. Here is an example of two samples that we compared. You can probably tell that they both have uh, more than one layer to them, but if you just looked at the top coat, those samples were indistinguishable. If you then looked at the underlying layers, the one on the left was characterized as having a taupe colored top coat. We also got quite good at our naming, stone, tan, et cetera. <clears throat> the second layer had air voids in it and was classified as a medium gray. Then there was a thick white powdery layer, et cetera. A five layer paint system. That sample being compared to the one on the right, where the top coats were comparable, showed an underlying layer chemistry of white, turquoise, white, turquoise, white, and then brown, a seven layer system, quite different from its pair and quite different from anything else in the study as it happens. I also want to note here that the sample on the right was originally uh, characterized as a gray, so it was compared to all the gray-black group, and the one on the left was in the brown group. But because the analyst who looked at the sample on the right thought that there were brown undertones to it, that sample was brought over into the browns, and that's how that inner comparison took place. So again, even though a sample started out in one group, if the color was questionable, it might be compared into another group to not miss any pairwise comparisons that would, should be performed. So in this example, these samples were eliminated or discriminated from everything else and from each other. Here's another example. These are a yellow top coat. The finish is uh, similar, and so they were considered to be indiscriminated, undiscriminated up to this point. If you look at the underlying layers, these were both two-layer paint systems, a yellow over a white. FTIR analysis was then performed on the top coat, the yellow layer. The samples were still considered to be undifferentiated. 
but then FTIR of the underlying white layer clearly shows one is kaolin based and one is talc based. And so again, those samples were able to be discriminated based on FTIR of the underlying layer. So that's kind of the approach that we were using for the samples. And now we'll talk about the actual discrimination power we found within the HUD group, so 80% of the population that we're looking at. That consisted of 760 samples that were compared. That was over 290,000 intercomparisons. From that, 109 pairs remained. So from 290,000 pairs, just macroscopic and microscopic exams brought us down to 109 pairs left undifferentiated. 108 of those pairs, which constituted 79 samples, was brought forward to FTIR. One pair was brought forward to SEM because the layer structure was too complicated to assess up to this point. And I'll discuss that sample a little bit more later. Then from that FTIR group and that one pair in SEM, 32 pairs remained. So we've gone from 290,000 pairs to 109 to 32, just based on visual microscopic and FTIR. Now let's talk about the white samples, 20% of the population. The white samples were a beast. <laughs> Walking into the lab every day, 197 pillboxes staring at us. <laughs> How do we do this? <clears throat> we decided that um, the best thing to do was having gone through and assessed all these samples as having a white top coat layer, we went back to the paperwork that, that we as analysts had originally used to characterize the underlying layer structure of these samples. Anything that had five or more layers was pulled from the population and assessed just based on that visual microscopic assessment initially. So anything that had five or more layers, um, there were a couple that were less than five layers but had very unusual layer structures, a white, a forest green, a white, or a white, a bright red, and a white. All of those, which constitute 77 samples, were compared just by inner comparison of that visual microscopic assessment on the paperwork. Those 77 samples were distinguishable from each other and of course from the rest of the population. That brought us down to a smaller subset, but we then tried to continue with, along this path and say, okay, these samples are single layer, they'll all be intercompared. These samples have two layers, they'll be intercompared. These samples have three or more layers, they'll be intercompared. That got very difficult very quickly. And I'll just flip forward and then come back to this again. <clears throat> if this is an example of one of the samples we were looking at, <clears throat> you might be able to tell that there's three layers in this example and the top layer is white. If we then tried to compare that visually to the sample next to it, we weren't sure if that sample was a very thick single layer or if that was multiple applications of the same paint, et cetera. But the tops were white and to this point were visually indistinguishable. Then you have a sample on the right where the, white, the top layer is also white and the second un, first underlying layer might be comparable to the one next to it. It was, it was getting very confusing <laughs> as to how to assess these samples. So what we did was we said, okay, we're just gonna take the FTIR analysis, a thin peel of the top layer of all of these samples and analyze them by FTIR. In doing that, we were able to then form groups um, very readily where some contained kaolin, some contained calcium carbonate, some contained both, and some contained neither. And that provided much smaller populations to deal with. We then, performed FTIR analysis, as I said, and even groups where the um, samples might look comparable visually, we were able to discriminate based on FTIR of the top coat. There were some where we couldn't discriminate by FTIR, but then doing a, a visual comparison of the samples in that subset, color did discriminate between samples. So we've dealt with the huge samples, we've dealt with the white samples, but we still felt that we needed to go back and assess any samples within what we called the off-white group that might need to be compared to the whites, some that were very, very light in color. And there were 54 samples we identified from what we'd originally termed as HUD that we thought needed to go back and be assessed against the whites. Many of those samples were visually consistent with the whites. And so again, FTIR analysis was performed on the top coats 
And based on that assessment, 12 pairs required further analysis. Performing then microscopic exams on those 12 pairs discriminated six more. Performing FTIR, and FTIR analysis on additional layers discriminated an additional pair. So of those 54 samples that had to go back and be compared to the whites, five pairs remained. So kind of bringing it all back around to our original analytical scheme, 960 samples were originally part of our population. 200 top coats were analyzed by FTIR. I'm just talking about top coats here to try and provide some context of the number of samples that had to go forward. I'm not taking into account where we needed to do underlying layers by FTIR. <clears throat> so from those, say, 200 samples, 43 had to go forward to SEM at this point. <clears throat> this is the sample I originally talked about that we didn't want to bring forward to FTIR because we had absolutely no idea where one layer started and where one ended, just based on visual microscopic assessment. So we embedded the sample, and by backscatter, we can see that within this pair, these layer structures were comparable. You can see there were, there were 10 layers in the samples, and you can see going across the screen, if your eye tracks across, you can see where the layers are looking pretty consistent. Both these samples were off-white visually, and they were from interior walls. So backscatter did delineate the layers for us, but EDS could not differentiate between the samples in any of the layers. We then went back and performed FTIR on the top layer and the bottom layer within this pair, and again, there was no discrimination. So at this point, we considered this pair undifferentiated, and we did not bring it forward to pyrolysis. In addition to that pair, 31 pairs went forward to SEM. That constituted 27 samples. That's from the HUD group only, the 80% of the population. Backscatter and EDS together discriminated 24 pairs from those 31. From the white and off-white group, 10 pairs went forward, which constituted 14 samples. And from that, seven pairs were discriminated. So again, 43 samples have gone forward to SEM, and now 19 samples need to go forward to pyrolysis to try and perform further differentiation. Seven of those pairs, or 14 samples, were part of the HUD group. Four pairs, or five samples, were part of the white and the off-white group. <clears throat> From the hued group, one was discriminated, leaving six indistinguishable pairs. So at this point in the analytical scheme, this is where we stop, and we say there are six pairs that we can't differentiate in that hued group. <clears throat> in the white and off-white group, one pair of two-layer samples, which was a white over a cream layer structure, both layers were indistinguishable by pyrolysis. There were three two-layer samples, again, white over cream, and both layers in each of those samples were also indistinguishable. Here's just a pyrogram depiction of pairs that were discriminated by pyrolysis. These happen to be one of the hued pairs. You can see the styrene uh, discriminates these samples quite readily. And here's a pair that was not differentiated by pyrolysis. So where does that leave us? Over 950 samples were submitted and evaluated. One 10-layer plus pair was indistinguishable through SEM. 10 pairs were indistinguishable through pyrolysis. So going back to Tippett's work and determining which techniques provided the most discrimination, in his study, he looked at microchemical testing and microscopic examinations. If we lumped together our macroscopic and microscopic exams with FTIR, we found that we had 42 pairs that were indistinguishable after that suite of exams. That already provided a 99.991% discrimination. If you added further instrumental techniques, in that 4% of the original 960 samples went forward to SEM and less than 2% went forward to pyrolysis, you have an overall discrimination where only 11 pairs remained indistinguishable, which was a 99.998% overall discrimination. What were those indistinguishable pairs? Well, there were two that were single layer pairs. One was a dark blue. One pair, one sample was originally assessed as having a brown top coat, and one was assessed as having a green top coat. And I know that sounds a little bit funny when you think of brown and green, but the colors were quite light, and when you put them uh, within the brown group, it was indiscriminated, within the green group, it was indiscriminated, and then you put them together, and the colors were quite close. 
Most of the samples were two-layer systems. There was one that was a 10-layer system. <clears throat> and you'll look in the pair numbers and you'll see there's three pairs that are listed as seven, eight, nine. Those were three samples that formed three pairs. So that's, of the 11 indistinguishable pairs, that's three within that listing of off-white two-layer samples. So conclusions. Tippett found that two pairs of samples from different sources were comparable. And I should note that in his uh, discrimination power of one in a quarter million and one in a million, depending on what techniques he used, he excluded from that discrimination assessment any pairs that he found originated from the same source. So having anything that originated from the same source, he did not include in his discrimination assessment. And he still found in his study two pairs of samples from different sources that were comparable. For each indistinguishable pair in this study, the samples were collected from the same building or structure. Therefore, within this study, there were no random pairs observed to be indistinguishable. Everything that we paired up came from the same building, structure, et cetera. So in conclusion, macroscopic and microscopic exams in combination with FTIR remain the most powerful discriminators. I don't think anyone's really surprised to hear that. SEM and PIGCMS, though, can provide additional discrimination and should be utilized. It saved us in the case of that 10-layer system. We definitely needed backscatter to elucidate those layers. And single-layered or neutral-colored samples can contain enough characteristics to allow for a strong association in a comparative architectural pain exam. We'd like to acknowledge everyone who submitted samples to this study. It was quite a process. But Jeff Bryant and the Center for Forensic Sciences and our ERT squads definitely submitted a lot of samples. And I'd also like to thank Andrea for getting us going on this project. It was her uh, initiative that got us going, and I really think it will be a benefit to the community. If there are any questions, I'll take them now. Well, in your uh, screening of the uh, cross-sections, I didn't hear you mention, and apparently you didn't do it, but fluorescence microscopy, did you try or consider that as a potential way of uh, making further uh, discrimination? at that level? We did not. We did not try it. I'd be open to talking about it more, but we didn't try it. Is there any reason um, why you didn't try it, or just you just don't normally? Uh, we we do don't normally because it, it isn't something that, that we've done historically. Okay. But thank we're you. open to ideas. OK, thank you. Um, about 30% of the work we do is architectural, but a lot of the architectural work we do is historic samples. So we look at architectural paint from 1600 to 2009. And like Skip said, fluorescence microscopy can be incredibly helpful. Generally speaking, synthetic binders will exhibit a very dim fluorescence, where natural binders, oils, some alkyds, nitrocellulose, will tend to fluoresce. So if you don't have access to SEMEDS, which we do, fortunately, fluorescence microscopy is an add-on of maybe five, $8,000 to a polarized light microscope. It's a very quick discriminator. Further, some pigments exhibit characteristic fluorescence, which can be helpful. When that technique doesn't work, another tool we found useful is to cut or microtome a thin section and go back to the first technique I learned, which was polarized light microscopy, where you can start to compare layers based on the particle composition, particle size distribution, et cetera. Um, and I should have prefaced this by thanking you for this study, because I think it's fabulous. Very good work. Thank you. Go ahead, Ed. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, I, I also want to thank, I think that was an excellent study. Um, something else that I might, thought I might mention is that uh, we've looked at uh, quantitating titanium dioxide in fibers as fillers, and this might be considered as an additional study if, if one might want to do any more than you, you had done. But if you look at the concentration of titanium dioxide, which is uh, readily done using Raman spectroscopy, uh, that can also be a useful discriminating uh, method. Thanks, Ed. Again, nice piece of work, a lot of work. <laughs> uh, to add on to Skip's comment, a uh, technique that's highly underused in forensic laboratory is cathode luminescence. I did a paper in 1996 at the Trace Symposium, and Chris just did a chapter in a book, and Joanne, I think, will back me up on this. Especially white paints, off-white paints, cathode luminescence, every time distinguish between them just by putting them in under the scope and looking at them. Thanks, Tom. 
Hello, I'm Sal Bianca from the Maryland State Police Crime Lab. Uh, just a quick comment, uh, I enjoyed your paper. Uh, on the last uh, proficiency test that came around, it was all white paint, and I was sort of pressed for time, so uh, I started to think, what can I do quickly? So I grabbed a crime scene scope and tried a variety of wavelengths and different goggles, and I could distinguish all the white paints. They all fluoresce differently. Sorry, by which technique? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, it was called a crime scene scope. It's an alternate light source. It's like a 500 watt uh, light bulb. And down and dirty, quick screening, I could discriminate them. That would have come in handy with 197 pillboxes. <laughs> <laughs> we just walked in the lab every day. <sighs> By the way, in regard to the, the comments I made that, that uh, the work that was done with uh, uh, studying the titanium dioxide was done uh, in uh, Steve Morgan's group at South Carolina, and there's, it's, it's been published in applied spectroscopy. Thanks, Ed. One more, just very, uh, one more very, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. W w one more, ver just very brief comment. Um, white paints, which can be incredibly difficult to differentiate, suffer from the problem that natural binders like alkyds and oils, those binders will discolor in the absence of light. So if it's covered by a top coat, um, you look in your kitchen cabinets, they'll be yellow. The outside of the cabinet is bright. So if you find evidence that is protected from sunlight and white paint that has been exposed to sunlight over time, a simple macroscopic examination may cause those two colors to appear very different. So one thing when we do when trying to determine an historic paint color is often to photo bleach the sample to eliminate the discoloration. It's a process that Rubens used back in 1600s after rolling paintings, putting them on ships and sending them across vast distances. He would say, unroll the painting and expose it to sunlight for three days, and the whites will be white instead of yellow. So if your visual discrimination shows two different hues or two, two different off-whites, it might be helpful to photo bleach that. You can do that with a fluorescence microscope or a long-wave UV lamp over a period of hours. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you.